Okay, welcome back to the PDR Coach Podcast. So many of you know, because I've talked about it so many times, that my dad was one of the original owners of a Dent Pro franchise. Uh, today, I'm super excited because I have the honor to have a special guest on the podcast today, who was the owner of the Dent Pro Corporation, the franchisor, if you will. Mitch, I've always looked up to you as a businessman ever since I was a kid, because my dad always talked about you. And so I'm super excited to have you on the podcast today and share your knowledge of the industry with everybody else. So thank you for giving, giving us some time. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Corey. I appreciate the invitation. And you know, obviously, it's been a great run. And mm -hmm. I'm, uh, hopefully, I can help you out and we can talk, have some fun today. Yeah, exactly. So the same way I start every podcast, and I'm super excited to hear this because uh, I know you were one of the original people to start in this industry, but how did you find this weird little niche of PDR? Yeah, really an interesting story. I I grew up in the car business uh, from the earliest I can remember. I, I started, my dad was a sales manager and owner of a business, a car dealership. So I came up washing cars, running cars, renting cars, selling cars, doing the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then in my mid twenties, I decided to get out of the retail side of it or on, in the dealer side of it and start my own company that represented banks and got their repos and sold for them. I would cro go across the United States, buy some cars and bring them back into California. And on my last visit into Oklahoma, uh, I went to buy a little car, a little Porsche, you know, some dents on the side of it. And, you know, part of my negotiation was obviously the body work that needed to be done. However, this guy said, you know, go, go down into this uh, neighborhood. This guy will take these dents out without the use of paint or Bondo. Well, <laughs> back then thinking that I knew every uh, technique that there was, I, I obviously was very uh, dubious of, of what he was talking about. However, I trusted him because I did had done some business with him. And I went down to this guy, he took my car in to his garage, closed the garage door, had me sit outside of his house for a couple of hours. Car came back and the, the, the car was clean. Needless to say, I, I my heart started beating a mile a minute. I couldn't believe what just happened. I I literally thought that he went down to the to a you know to a junkyard, got a door and, and put a new door on it. That that's how couldn't, my mind was. Couldn't working. even comprehend the no. alternatives. No, it was, it was back then it was so secretive, um, you know, and that's part of the, the, the story and the adventure of this whole thing. But yeah, uh, on my plane flight home, that's all I could think about was, you know, I've got to figure out what this is and how we can bring this service out to the West coast. And um, so doing some, doing some background work, found out that obviously mm -hmm. Dent Wizard was becoming established and established maybe a year or two before we did. Um, and there was other people out there, uh, Dent Wizard wanted to tie us up you know, on a contract. We didn't want to do that. So I found somebody that would train us and, uh, I did. So you, and that's you, how we got started. You considered maybe becoming a Dent Wizard franchise or something? You're, I didn't or, consider okay. becoming one. I just wanted to know what they gotcha. would offer and, you know, if they would train us and, and those kinds of things. And back yeah. then again, it was very secretive and everybody was very close very close to the vest and what they would offer and what they wouldn't offer. And, um, and, and that went on for, yeah. I mean, decades or a decade of hiding behind repairs. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think probably 91, I think probably by the time 97, 98 came around, you know, that was pretty much, that was pretty much it. Yeah. It was out. So you decided being, being the entrepreneur minded person that you were, you decided, okay, I don't want to get tied up in a contract for them to train me. So I'm just going to, figure this out myself on the west coast and that's what you yeah do. yeah we uh you know again being in the car business growing up in an entrepreneurial family uh, not wanting to work for anybody uh we just we wanted to figure out a way that we could bring this service out and get it started uh, again we we uh contracted with this guy back in oklahoma and we still didn't know what the service was i thought it was a machine to be honest with you, that did this. Mm. I didn't know it was a metalworking business. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually sold areas before we even started and sold the idea to guys that we knew, your dad being one of them. Um, and we all bought into it. Uh, they trusted us. And, you know, we we thought we knew what was going to happen. And and uh, so we put, put our money together and we started the company. Wow. I didn't know that it went that way. So 
so you sold franchise. I think you, I think you knew my, I think you knew my dad's business partner better, better, right? Roger Scala. I, yeah, I knew okay. Roger and Gary yeah. to my brother, Dave, Dave oh, okay. actually knew Roger. Actually, I played with, funny enough, I played uh, baseball with Roger back, uh, oh, back in, back in the, our college days, but <laughs> we weren't insane. friends at that time. Uh, but you know, we did play ball together. So they, so these, there were six people, right? Six original franchise owners. Is that right? I believe there was six. Okay. That's what my dad has said. So if we'll, we'll it sounds it right. So it was either five or six, <laughs> okay. one of the two. So yeah. they all bought in originally to that and not even knowing yet at that point, um, what you were going to get, whether this guy was from Oklahoma was going to come show you how to use this machine that popped dents out or, or what, but you just all, no, they, we had no idea what we were getting into. None, zero. <laughs> That's pretty so we, cool. we, uh, we actually rented a garage in the Monterey area and, uh, and the guy showed up in a, in a, in a, with a truck, with a, with a trailer, a little, little trailer behind him, And all of a sudden he started taking out all the tools and, uh, a bunch of PVC pipe and that's how it started. And I, and I know from my, everyone knows this from my dad's experience and past experience, obviously that was your PDR training, but it's, I don't even know if it's fair to call it training for the fact that he, you know, it was so beginner, it was PVC pipe and, and push on the back of metal. Is that fa a fair way to explain the training? Yeah, Corey, it was even <laughs> probably worse than that. Um, you know, we had to use lighting to light up the PVC pipe in a dark area. And then we had to scratch the back of the panel to try to find our tip. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we had to kind of scratch our dent out the best we could. And then we used metal tappers on, you know, metal on metal cars and that didn't leave great marks as well. And uh, so it was an interesting, it was an interesting first, first one week of training uh, we were all believers because um, he was good enough to make us believe. Yeah. And um, so we went out there, you know, thought we knew we had, we had it down. So yeah, I mean, that's it, it though. I mean, the first step of doing anything is believing is the belief that it's possible or belief that you can do it. So that's, a, at least he gave you that. That's probably worth the, without question. There. Yeah. Without that's probably worth paying him to train, even though obviously we are all continuing to learn how to push metal even better. But that started in 91. Um, so obviously, I mean, you you started the Denpro franchise, six originals. Um, it got a lot bigger than that. Can you talk about a little bit of the history, maybe the first, like, I don't know, five or 10 years, how you grew, how you trained, um, how you just launched this? I mean, you were instrumental in launching the industry itself, especially out here in the West Coast. So how do you, how did that, how that happen? Yeah, we, we. The first, so we went out and obviously we didn't know what we were doing. Um, we went out and were literally destroying cars because we didn't know what we we're doing. And after I would say about three or four months into this thing, and I had hired my brother-in-law, my sister's, my wife's brother. Yeah. And, um, you know, he was my first employee and he, he didn't take a dent out for maybe six weeks, didn't make a dime. And he came from a real high, nice paying job. <laughs> Um, so I had three or four months of us really not making any money. And, and unfortunately, we had taken money from people that we knew and friends and wanted to make this happen. And, uh, you know, it wasn't working. And I, I, I have to say that at that point, probably six months, six months into it, I was I really didn't think we we're going to make it at all. Um, and fortunately, Dent Wizard was uh, they happened to have a guy in town here close to me that they had put i mean they, they were relatively new as well but you know they had a guy here in a, in a neighboring town that was actually doing work and doing good work and so one thing that it helped me with was that this was a legit industry we just had to figure out how to do it um i would i had a lot of friends in the industry a lot i knew a lot more people than he did however he knew how to do it so he would come and fix a car. I would take apart the car, the, the door panel and look at his, look at the markings behind the door to see how it differed from the way we did things. Um, that helped with uh, being able to change our system and change the way we removed a dent and how we looked at a dent. Um, and then I remember 
working on a, a Subaru down in in uh, San Jose, and it, it all of a sudden, like like it does in this industry, you see the dent, you see it come out, and you understand what you're trying to do. Clicked, um, and it clicked. And I think I think guys understand everything you're saying. Six months in, most people want to quit. And then at yeah. some point they get over a hump where they're like, oh, I actually fixed one. And then they think they're good. And then they get a harder dent and they're like, oh, I suck again. That's right. Well, <laughs> and thankfully, you know, once we figured it out, we, we all came back together because we would talk obviously every day trying to figure out what best practices were. And once I was able to show, you know, these guys, hey, look, this is how we can do this thing. You know, we started taking off in a, in a pretty good in a, in a pretty good rate. Uh, we had, uh, we had a, we had a uh, front page news story done us on the San Francisco Chronicle, which at the time newspapers were a big thing. And then on the business section, they did a, they did, they did a story on us. We also had uh, the biggest local TV news station do a story on us at the time. Nice. And at that point, people started knocking on our door and calling us and want to be part of the, part of the process. And um, we decided in 1993 to become a franchise company. We are at the time selling licenses, lic licensed areas. Mm -hmm. But we realized that, you know, for us to be able to grow, uh, because we didn't have a lot of money still, uh, we needed to franchise this thing to, you know, yeah. to handle all the people that wanted to be part of it. Sure. So, you know, in 1993, we franchised and we sold franchises throughout the United States. And, um, you know, we <laughs> At, at, at our height, we had about, you know, 200 technicians out there and, wow. you know, doing, doing, you know, 20 million, 22 million a year uh, gross. And, and, uh, you know, we, it, it grew really well. It was, it was, a, it was a fun ride, real that's, fun ride. That's a big business. So yeah. how, so you had 200 technicians and, and at, at a certain, eventually they ended up all going through a debt pro training, something that you created to actually teach them. Cause I mean, you didn't really get taught so well but you had a system eventually was that in the mid 90s or did that come later no it came i would say oh uh early yeah mid 90s early mid 90s 94 yeah. 95 where we started to train more people and our training classes were anywhere from five to ten people at a time our training was four weeks uh we would do uh two weeks of inside training and two weeks of outside training Mm. Um, where, I mean, two weeks of actually sitting on a door panel yeah, yeah. and, and just doing it and then taking it out to a lot in live cars, uh, very rigorous. Um, we, we, I trained, you know, over, over four or 500 guys, something like that. That sounds good. We had four probably or about guys. So you weren't only yeah. training people that were going to come work for you as a franchise. You were training people from out of state too. And other I was training other people. Yeah. Um, I'm talking about total overall in, yeah. in my, in my career, not right then. Yeah. Uh, no, it was all it was all dent pro. Okay. We I had about an eighty percent uh, success rate. Twenty percent would would actually fail the class. They, they couldn't even make it through the four weeks. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that was difficult. But you know, we had people coming from, you know, Puerto Rico, Panama, you know, Hawaii. Uh, you know, they they'd make the trip, and yeah. we'd keep them we'd keep them here for a month, and it was it was rigorous. So for. Uh, for the Dem Pro, obviously, they had a, they, you guys, I mean, trained a lot of people. You've had pretty significant um, influence in that. And just a few guys, for people listening, um, a few guys that I know personally that came, that were originally from Dem Pro and probably got either trained from you or trained by somebody who was trained by you <clears throat> were guys like Aaron, Eric Patton, Ian Cordell, uh, Sal Contreras actually was original, uh, originally Dent Pro and Ray Sapnu, all these guys. And, and I don't even know if you know this, Mitch, but those names that I just gave out are fairly influential in this industry, still doing dent repair at a very high level, have shops, have big businesses, have created tools uh, for our industry, all that stuff. And a lot of them came from the original Dent Pro franchises. I don't know if you knew that, but I think the the effect that you've had on our industry, especially out in this area on the West Coast, is still going. Yeah, um, that's that's well said, Corey. Yeah. I think I I I know a lot of guys that are still doing paintless dent repair that started mm -hmm. in Dent Pro, and so that that tells that tells you one thing is that we had a successful model. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, everybody left for different reasons, and I get it. And you know, I'm sure we're going to probably get into that at some we point, will. but. <laughs> Um, 
you know, we were, we, we had a difficult training process and we had, we had, a, we had, a, we had, a, we had a good system. We had, you know, company meetings. We had, uh, we gave away, you know, top technician awards. We had, mm-hmm. we, we, we had it going. It was, it was, yeah. we, we had a lot of people going, going really well. So I, I know the training's hard. I, I went to your training and that was actually you training me. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. That was uh, probably 17 or 18. It was 2004. Right after I graduated high school, I decided I'd take a semester off before I went to college and go to PDR training with you. Yeah. yeah. Um, this has been a long time. So that, I mean, we're coming up on close to 20 years ago on that. Um, do you remember that I showed up a week late? <laughs> I don't, I don't, but that's, that, that couldn't have been easy then on anybody. <laughs> no, I, I, um, I don't know what happened, but my, my 17 year old scheduling skills or whatever, I thought it was the week after. And I, and I showed up a week late and I, I remember you not, not being very happy for the fact that I was a week late. <laughs> you probably had a conversation with my dad at the point and like, this guy's not going to make it. He can't even fucking show up on time. <laughs> Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that wouldn't have gone over well. I was pretty, yeah. I was pretty hard on people. Yeah, yeah, I, I, no, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> I remember. And I think you're extra hard on me, but, but this is the interesting thing. So I've been working with my dad since I was like 14. I would go on summers and I would push down. Basically we'd go to like a Hertz car sale lot. He'd fix 15 cars and I would work on one. I'd hack up one dent all day long. Um, and then he'd come behind me, behind me and fix it. And we go to the next place and we do the same thing. So I, I had been pushing on dents for years and years before I actually came to your training. So I remember I showed up a week late and I was, I, I was a cocky asshole, to be honest, like a 17 year old kid. I was like, I, I know how to do dent repair. I've been doing dent repair for a long time. And I remember that, uh, you put a baseball in a sock and hit the door or a golf ball or something, a ball and hit the door and, um, told me that I had to fix that. And uh, I worked on it for the entire day. And I don't remember what it looked like. I'm sure it was pretty shitty. Um, but I remember that you were happy enough with it that I was able to uh, leave training. <laughs> you were like, I don't know why you're here. I don't know why your dad sent you. You've already, um, you've already been pushing for so long. Like, I can't teach you anymore. Just go fix debts. Do you remember any of this? Or is it just me being influenced? No, but it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me. Okay. Because, you know, back then, uh, after training so many people, you get a sense of, mm-hmm. you know, where, where if somebody's got the skill or the patience to get mm-hmm. through, you know, most people think that they do They every, but every, every single person that I interviewed beforehand told me that they're going to be great at this and they have what it takes every single one. <laughs> and there was guys, I, you know, a couple just quick stories. One, a guy came from Hawaii, settled in and by one o'clock that same day, he was back on a plane going home. I had, uh, I had guys break down crying. I had guys, uh, you know, you know, not believe what they were saying or they would, they would just, they, 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 they just couldn't in their mind, they just couldn't understand why they weren't getting it. And Mm -hmm. it was, and so every dank guy's like nodding their head up and down, like, yep, yep. I remember this. Yeah. (laughs) And, and, and on the other side, it was probably, I don't know, maybe a half a dozen guys, and I can remember them that were good from almost the first couple of hours that had whatever inside of them they had, they were able to, uh, you know, have the patience and be able to determine what next steps were. And that was, that was a lot of fun to be able to train those kind of guys. Yeah, I bet. Uh, but that was very rare, very mm-hmm. rare. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Okay, so I just want to touch on that because it's something I've thought about many times over the years, but um, p- pretty funny. I remember I, I remember going and meeting you the first time getting trained. So can't believe it's been 17 years. But uh, so franchise model got up to, you know, tens of millions of dollars, a couple hundred people working for you. Um, I, I'm sure you had big, big goals to get it even past that or maybe to uh, compete with Dent Wizard or or whatever. Um, I don't know what your goals are, but it didn't go that way. Unfortunately, what happened? I'm, this, I'm genuinely. Yeah. Curious. Yeah. I, Den Wizard, our, our model and Den Wizard's model is completely different. Den Wizard was a wholly owned. They had a couple of franchises or area yeah. owners, sure. one out here actually. Um, but most of them were working for Den Wizard and Den Wizard was able to, um, secure big accounts and put their people in there. 
And so they had, uh, you know, they had control of, of, of where they were going and how they were doing. And then obviously Cox bought them and then they flipped it a few times with uh, investment groups and, mm-hmm. you know, they, and, yeah. and so, you know, they've, they've done it, they've done it. Their model was excellent for what they were doing. You know, we, on the other hand, didn't do that. We, we sold out, um, you know, uh, franchises to people and wanted to build businesses thinking that by uh, having a, a name that could translate uh, someone's calling you yeah let me just get off this here uh, having a system that could translate to the retail market the dealer market you know get that out there and, and uh, being high touch high service level you know look good the whole thing that we would be able to create a business that would sustain itself unfortunately um, what we found out was that in a service model where you aren't holding people accountable to a product, uh, for example, if you're selling, if you're selling a restaurant franchise, you know, if they're buying so much meat, so much material from you, then you know what their sales are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you go to a service business, you know, we had, we had models, we had created models of how many cars a day, how many wholesale, how many retail, what the pricing should be. In fact, the price can model that the one inch, two inch, three inch, four inch dent started with Dent Pro. You know, we got everybody together and started that model and everybody went to it. Uh, people can say whatever they want. They can, say, they can say that I started it, but they didn't. Dent Pro started that, that thing. So we, we had created this system in place. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but if you can't, You know, like any entrepreneur, and me included, I don't blame people for leaving because I feel the same way. Why do I need to work for you when I can go do it myself? And so, you know, over time, contractually, we had franchises. The problem with the franchises was that they couldn't keep anybody. You know, they would train somebody, invest a lot of money and time and give somebody a route. And all of a sudden that that guy would leave and it it became bad blood. And, um, you know, the... Unfortunately, w- w- the, that model was unsustainable. Uh, and to this day, when people ask me about franchising or, or you know, what my thoughts are, I, I, I tell them exactly what I think about it. If it's a service model, I'm, I tell them, don't do it. You're not, you're not going to be, you're not going to be successful. Not going to work. Um, but you know, if it's if it's a product, if it's something that you can control the, the customer base with, it's a whole different story. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so you know, we morphed into. A, a, what we are today, we've got, you know, probably 70 guys still left with it under the Dent Pro flag. We, uh, you know, we've got more licensees out there that, you know, pay us for the use of our name and some area, some areas that are protected, but it's not, you know, the big franchise model that it was yeah. before. And franchising, again, it's so regulated mm-hmm. that the uh, federal government makes you do a lot of crazy things to stay in business. And I wasn't, uh, I wasn't too fond of that as well. I meant to ask this in the beginning, but where did the name come from? Because I mean, I, I love the name and now it's, it's a name that quite frankly, whether people can or are allowed to or not, people all over the country use it, even though I know that you have it protected <laughs> as best as you can federally protected. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, it is right. Oh yeah. We're, we're trademarked, but there's other people using our name and yeah. So, you know, they, 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 they 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 make money off of it, but for yeah. me to go to me for me to go after all these guys it's, every yeah, day it just yeah. doesn't work for me. Right. I, if I go into that if I go into that market, I can shut them down right away. But yeah. you know, unless I'm in the market, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, I get that. But I'm saying the ne- the name itself is great. People use it. Obviously, I can think of ten different Dent Pros off the top of my head. Um, whether they add their name to it or their specific location in in the state or whatever. Um, I know it might seem obvious because it's such a good name, Dent Pro, but how'd you come up with it? Do you remember it? Yeah, it's good. Good, good question. Yeah. So we uh, obviously Dent Wizard was uh, a, a company that started before us, Dent Master, yeah. which we actually liked that name as well. So we were trying to come up with something that was similar to that one. Yeah. We didn't like Dent Wizard. Yeah. Although, you know, again, they, they, they become a great company and they're well, Lido. You know, I told you, I told you the other day, Lido was interviewed on a different podcast and he said he came from another country and came over here and people just used to all always call him that. That's where the name came from. People would be like, Oh man, you're a dent wizard. And that's where the name came from. Makes, so. makes, makes sense. <laughs> like we don't makes like sense. it now. Cause it's like, it's like, 
you know, we say it's not magic kind of thing. And so it was like a little right. weird thing, but like, that's just that in the night 91, it, it kind of seemed like magic, honestly. That's right. It, it certainly <laughs> did. And, and it worked. And so Dent Pro, we, I think the original, I think it was the original group that we sat around. Yeah. We didn't have a name at the time when we started. I don't believe, I don't know if we had a name when we did our first license agreements or not. It, I don't think that we did, but definitely the guys that were part of that original group, again, they were all friends and you know, we're all getting this together, had a hand in coming up with the name. And then we came up with the logo design and we had a couple mm -hmm. of different iterations of that. But yeah, basically, you know, what you see today is what we came up with, you know, 30 years ago. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, we see it. I actually had it, uh, was wearing my a hat the other day or had a logo going around and one of the guys, Ray Sapnew, uh, reached out to me. He's like, oh, I, I remember that logo. He like worked out in Arizona back in the late 90s and was like, that's the original Jim Pro. It's still the same, it's still the same yeah. logo and still recognizable to a lot of different people for sure. But he's yeah. like obviously grateful. He doesn't work for Dempro anymore. He lives out in uh, Chicago now, mm -hmm. but um, and chased hail all around and all that stuff. Um, speaking of that, did did Dempro ever get into the hail business ever? Like we did, we did, we yeah. did a little bit. I, I wasn't fond of it. I, mm -hmm. I, I wasn't. It, it, it's a great business. There's great yeah. guys in it, and, and it's it's a whole different technique than guys that are going on a route. So mm -hmm. different techniques, different ways of making money artists great guys they do it fast mm. um but i i i got a little tired of having to um worry about guys not showing up or they'd be have a lot of personal issues and we'd have to chase hail and put them up and i just i, I like more uh you know you, you can rely on the route a little bit a little bit easier once you make that so yeah. you're not waiting yeah we got not, into it for a while. waiting on on weather events <laughs> to dictate whether or not you'll have business I guess yeah, one no doubt. And there's, and there's guys out there that, that do a great job with it and God bless them. And I just, I, I wasn't fond of it. Yeah. Um, you and I, we've talked a little bit more recently. I mean, when I first started at Dempro, we didn't talk much, but over the last several months, we've talked about some ideas that I've had um, about Dempro. As I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to take these, uh, I'm going to have to just go on the microphone because my, uh, Air, my, my AirPods are, yeah, they're, so okay. I'm going to see how I do that now. Just put them away and it should switch. I can still hear you. Right, so. Um, so yeah, audio, a little bit of audio change, but that it should be all right. It still sounds pretty good. Um, ever since I was a young, ever since I was a young kid working at Dempro again, 14, 15, 16, I've always been like a, I've always had big visions, big ideas or want to be successful, all that type of stuff. But I've always, I always wanted dent pro or a company to uh compete with dent wizard because you know i started pushing in 04 really um pretty seriously in 08 and 09 and, and full-time since then for the most part um and they've always been the top dog the big company owned by own you know hundreds of employees owned by big um hedge funds and things like that um you tried to compete with Dent Wizard and maybe probably the most most successfully. I don't know of another company who is putting up those numbers. Maybe Dent Smart, but I'm not, I don't know their numbers. But can someone it, it seems it doesn't make sense in my head that Dent Wizard is up at that level that they're at alone. Like when you look at Home Depot, there's the Lowe's. When you look at the Walmart, there's the Target and the Pepsi has Coke, and like there's always the competition. But in this industry, Dent Wizard, I mean, really doesn't have that is it possible still to grow a company from now to to even compete with that i mean what are your thoughts on that yeah I, there is uh however it's going to take somebody with some enormous um focus and uh they're going to have to do they're going to have to put a plan in place that uh, they can't, they're going to, it, 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 it's going to have to be very rigorous. And I do think that you can compete with it, but it will take a lot of commitment and it will take a group of people that want to buy into it. And, and it, it will be very difficult, but yeah, it could be done hundred percent. Does it have to be in the employee model? I mean, do you have to have like 700 employees or is there a licensing? I know you're 
you're, you're out on the franchises. That doesn't work. Is there another way to do it? Or does it just, does it have to be, you just kind of hire I, training? I think that there is. However, there has to be value. There has to be, um, again, there has to be, the model that you create has to create value for whoever's in the system. Um, yeah, you, can you do it with employees? I, I'm not sure you can. I think you've got to do it in some type of a, a co-op type of a situation with licensing, um, shared, uh, you know, shared customers, uh, that are, that are big. Those like some, kinds of- some dealer groups do that, right? Like big dealer groups will have like, a maybe like a GM owner where they like kind of partner with them to open up a new dealership. So they kind Absolutely. of work for them, but kind of partner with them. Yeah. Something yeah. I like think that. something along those lines that will create, again, create value and momentum. So when people do, uh, you know, do a, a Google search or check, check on that company that it has uh, volume and that it has uh, history mm-hmm. and that it, it, it can do what it says it can do that. And that's one thing that we still to this day, you know, we pride ourselves on the guys that work within the Dempro name um, still are, are very good at what they do. We have a lot of great guys and, and, you know, being, being reliable, uh, doing great work and getting paid for it is important to us. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's, you know, if you can get people thinking that way, yeah, I do. I do think you can do it. It's just, it's going to take quite a, it's going to, it's going to take an effort, but it, you know, Hey, anything else, anything in life does. Right. I mean, it's just really, you know what, so what? Yeah. A hundred percent. Young man, young man's game. Though. I'm going to be an old guy like me. I'll tell you that. You, 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 you have made your influence already for sure. Um, do you think like the, the employee model, um, nineties, early two thousands, even to this day, still, um, it was, it was easy, easier possible to leave and go start your own business because there was still, there's, there was not enough dent guys. Like when my dad in the late nineties, early two thousands, start, take a couple dealers, get some few customers, you're set. It's easy to do. I think it's getting more and more difficult. Like if someone came into the Sacramento, Sacramento market now, there's a half a dozen or a dozen really good technicians companies that are online that are at the dealers that have relationships with body shops, all that stuff, a lot more difficult to start a business. I've thought, or to even, or to even leave, you know, I'm going to quit working for Mitch and like take one or two of these little accounts and then go start my own business and be successful. I think that proposition is getting harder and harder. Um, and I see it shifting. What is your, what is your opinion on that? Like when it becomes really difficult to actually start a PDR business in an area, will people be more likely to stay and work for 50%? (laughs) What do you think? I think you're right in, in that it's harder for sure right now. Um, that's why I think there's an opportunity to consolidate and become, you know, a company that's got, uh, you know, more, you know, more influence out there uh, because of numbers, because of strength, because mm-hmm. of ideas. Um, you know, I think the 50% model works for some people. Hey, look, people that do it, do, do this business, they go out, they, they find jobs, they're selling people, they're doing their thing. So in general, you've got people out there with the personality that is entrepreneurial anyway. Yeah. So, you know, it doesn't lend itself to a guy that just wants to go you know, work eight hours a day and make a few hundred bucks and be an employee. It just doesn't. That's just Mm -hmm. not the way this, this business is wired. Now, if you had, if you had a company that had a lot of accounts and you could put people in there and say, look, I'm going to guarantee you X amount of dollars per month. Just go, go here. Sure. That could be done, but that's rare. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I I can't even think of too many places. I could think of a couple, but too many that would actually be able to do that. Yeah. And, you know, look, we, 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 at one time I had, you know, I was running not only the franchise deal, but I had 20, I had about 20 technicians that we were running at the time as well. So, you know, it's, I, I've been through that part of this, mm-hmm. you know, and they were all making good money. Yeah. What, yeah. What, what situation where, you know, anybody wasn't getting paid, they were all getting paid. Yeah. And then, it, but then it always comes, it's like inevitable. I mean, I've seen it. I've literally seen this as a child growing up. My dad started Dempro when I was five and I watched it 
my entire life. What either the guy leaves after two or three years or 13 or 15 years. I mean, we had a guy with us for 15 years and he finally decided I got to do it on my own. Yeah. Um, and it's amazing. I mean, I know the guys that there are guys that stay and whether, you know, we could be better business owners or we could have done more or we could have bent more or gave more or whatever. But my dad's attitude eventually is like at a certain point, it's like, you know, like you have to make money off the employee too at some point for it to even make sense. So, um, then that's, that's an interesting thing. I don't know if I can relate that to another, to another industry where it's so the barrier to entry is so high. And once you cross that barrier, the barrier to leave and go start your own business is so low. So like a body shop, barrier to entry is pretty high, lots of training, learn how to do the scale, all that stuff. But then to go to start your own body shop, it's a, that's a big commitment. Get a shop, get a paint booth, get all this stuff. You learn PDR, you go, you get a, go get a truck and you take your tools and you're, you're in business. Um, pretty interesting scenario. <laughs> and I know yeah, yeah. deal with this. For somebody to grow, they're going to, again, they're going to have to be hooked into, Hey, look, you know, we more, we pivoted to a, to a warranty company. Yeah. I was going to ask uh, you that next. That's gone, that's gone extremely well. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a lot of companies out there. You know, I think that there's opportunities for PDR companies and there, and there already are that hook into these warranty companies that, you know, handle, handle claims all day long. Mm -hmm. you know, there's ways of doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, not a lot of companies can say, hey, look, I can do your, your uh, dent repair all over the United States. We do that because we're contracted with a lot of people that are non-dent pro people. Mm -hmm. and, and we administrate for other companies. So, I mean, yeah, is there ways of doing it? Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. But it's, again, it, it, it's going to take uh, some people with some vision and, and that, that, and, um, that have some ability to create relationships with big businesses out there. Cause again, that's not easy. Mm -hmm. You know, people think they can do it, but, but once you really have to do it, it's, it just, it changes the whole dynamic stuff. And it, yeah, it's a big ladder to climb up too. I mean, to talk to like a corporate at CarMax to try to coordinate, uh, you know, I, I say that because Dent Wizard does that. They have this national contract with CarMax, whether anybody's seen it or not or whatever, <laughs> apparently it's true and they're in every CarMax. So for someone to rival that and create a co-op that says that will service every CarMax across the country, and that's a, it's a tall order. And then to get to car, corporate, corporate CarMax and, and sell them a va the value proposition of it. I mean, yeah, I can see how that would be very yeah, difficult. It's difficult, but, but it absolutely can be done because yeah. again, we've, we have been successful because of our name. Mm -hmm. we're, we're able to get into other businesses, other parts of the automotive business because of our name. Yeah. So that, that can, that definitely can happen. Yeah. So talk about that too. Yeah. I know you guys pivoted on the back end. I know you do um, dent warranties and some battery solutions. I think key, key solutions as well. Can you uh, specifically dent warranties? There's actually, I, I, we service a lot of dent warranties, including you and, and a lot of others. Um, there's a lot of dent guys out there that, quite frankly, have a bad taste in their mouth with dent warranties and they just don't service them for a variety of reasons, whether the they don't pay enough or they don't pay at all, or they take six, nine months to pay, or it's a fight every time or whatever. Can you talk on, on the back end of dent warranties and what it looks like and why, you know, maybe make a case for why dent guys should uh, reach out to dent warranties and work for them? Yeah, I can. Uh, you're right. There's a lot of different companies out there. And unfortunately, you know, the front side of it, when they're selling the warranty, they all sound the same. Mm -hmm. The administrative part of it is real different. A lot of people uh, handle claims differently. Our, our idea, because we came from this industry, because we know what you're going through, it's important not only to pay you enough money to get you excited about it, but to pay you on time and to make sure that you're taken care of. So we make sure that when we get a claim, we find the best people in the area. We pay them the most money or somewhere in there, depending on what it is. We pay them on time. They get their check and there's never an issue. If there's an issue. I'd rather overpay. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, but that, 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 that um, attitude comes from being in the business for 30 years. I know what you're going through. I don't want you guys feeling, oh man, are we going to get paid? Are we getting paid enough? That, that's ridiculous. Yeah. So yeah, I, I I think the dent technicians out there um, have to be careful about who they're doing business with. Some people are some people are great at, at administrating the claims. Some aren't. Um, I'm not going to get into who is and who isn't. I know we're good. So I know that we 
we pay and we pay, we pay very quickly. Um, okay. So how about going, if someone is, uh, I know you said you service all over the country. I know I, I, I can, maybe I can fairly assume it's not every city, every major city, no. but I'm sure no. that's your goal to be there. <laughs> um, but if they wanted to find out, because there's somewhere they could go to see like, okay, that sounds kind of nice. I'd like to get some, uh, some dent warranty claims. Is there somewhere they can go to, to get on your preferred vendor list? I don't know what it's called. Uh, not for us. What, the, way we, the way we find a technician is when we sign up a dealer, we'll find out who they're dent. And we're going to ask a few questions about them. Typically, when a, when a dealer, especially someone who's been around for a while, that sells a lot of used cars they as a dent. What's up? Yeah, they're good at what they do. Yeah, so we're probably going to just do business with them, uh, even if, even if, oh, well, for example, you know, even in your area, we pay you to do the, uh, the claims, and yeah. you may have that dealer doing a used car recon. You know, correct. So, you correct. know, that, that happens. That that happens quite often, and and you know, if the guy that's when that uh, dealer doesn't want to do business with us, no problem. We'll we'll call it a couple of dealers in the area, find out who's got the top name mm -hmm. contract with them. Make sure that we pay them enough money and we'll, and we'll get them going. Get them going. I feel like we covered a lot here from the history of PDR um, and all the way through where you are now, uh, the pivots that you've made. That's typical. I mean, typical, you know, entrepreneurship stuff there um, <clears throat> still have, you said 70 guys still working for you. Is that what you said? They're still under the damn pro yeah. umbrella licensee or franchise. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's pretty big. Yeah. Are you, are you trying to grow that at all? No. No. <laughs> not actively. No, I'm not actively. Um, hey, look, these guys, uh, I, I want them around because if we have claims or uh, we need we need them, they, you know, they're there. And the relationship has been so it's been we've been around so long that it, it's it we we've made it very easy on both parties. Uh, there's not there's not controversy, there's not uh, what have you done for me lately? Everybody understands what the relationship is. And I'm good with that. Gotcha. What do you think? I asked this question to almost everybody that comes on. Um, what do you think the future of PDR looks like? In 91, obviously, we're talking, it's probably pretty close to 30 years later now. I don't know about the right month, but pretty darn close, 91 to 2021. Uh, what about 10 more, 20 more years down the road? What does our industry look like? Is it is it bigger? Is it more retail? Are there... Are there uh, PDR retail shops? Are there, is there a company rivaling Dent Wizard? What do you, I don't know if you put any thought into that, but what do you think? Well, hey, look, it, it comes down to where they're not going to, they're going to still make metal cars, right? I mean, if, if metal cars are being made, then this industry is going to be, be thriving. If it goes to some type of, uh, you know, plastic, which I don't think it will, um, steel industry is not going to allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, then, then we'll, we'll, we're going to be fine. Can you do it? Again, it, I think, yeah, can, 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 can the industry change to have another name, uh, you know, somebody that is out there with, uh, you know, that, that service, whether it's a, you know, Jiffy Lube type of a thing or, or yeah, sure, absolutely. Mm. But it's going to take, it's going to take investment. It's going to take that belief. And, and, you know, one thing I, one thing I did, I didn't want to do, uh, I, but I think was needed was more advertising. Mm. Uh, we spent a lot of money on training people trying, trying to get out there. But in real, in reality, if you want to get your name out there, you know, you've got to spend, you got to spend some money. Well, if you start spending money on advertising because of the way the industry is, you're educating the public on the industry. All day right on, and, it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it's just too much, you know? And so the, I don't, you know, back back when we started or back even 10 years ago, if you asked 100 people what paint and stent repair was, maybe, you know, 15 might know. If you ask 100 people now about paint and stent repair, maybe 50 might know, just public. And I'm just talking about the public. So <laughs> it's to the point where everybody knows about, I don't think so. Yeah. But it's getting there. And yeah. if, if, if somebody was to create, again, a reputation, a good name, um, you know, a system that's easily... Uh, easily or done replicable. it so yeah I, yeah can it happen sure but i don't know man i hey, look you know <laughs> it takes artists to be in this business right i mean you can't the the, the guys that are good in this business are are want to be good in this business and, and not, not for everybody you know a lot of people see oh i can do that but they get into it and 
they're out there. And, and hey, look, you know, when I was training, I still to this day tell people, hey, look, you can be a mediocre dent repair technician and make a lot of money. You can be the most, you can be the best technician in the world, and not make any money because you don't have it in you to go out, talk to people and to show them your wares and, and to be aggressive. So, you know, there's a fine line there where, how do you, how do you, how do you move that around? It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 so it's hard. I have made that analogy. I think that it is a service-based business, but if you look at other service-based businesses, you know, first things that come to mind, like HVAC tech, plumbers, things like that. There's a, there's a, there's a system to do that thing. Like if, if the, if the, uh, air conditioner is broken because of this problem, there's, you know, seven ways to fix it. And here's the steps to do so. Um, and I feel like that's why this industry is so difficult is because it is part skill, but it's actually part art, art part artistic ability to some extent. And I think if I ask somebody, um, if you could grow a big company employing a bunch of Michelangelo type artists, um, that worked for you and you made 50% off of all their paintings that you did, people would be like, that's, I don't, I don't know how that would work. Um, because those people are a different breed of people and it's, um, hard to be an artist and give up half of your, uh, gross revenue bringing in. And so when I relate it to that, I'm like, and I'm like, I think that's interesting. But then I also, on the other side, I'm like, well, there are art galleries, right? Like, so someone found a way to quote unquote, employ artists by saying, well, I have the place where the customers are. So if you want to put your art here, I'll take a cut. Of it. You don't necessarily work for me, but I have the place where the customers are, and then you can put your paintings here and sell them. So I've thought before, someone that's going to grow a large business needs to be like the art gallery. They just need to be the place, the name, the reputation, the whatever, where the customers are. That way they can find the artist slash skilled dent repair technicians to fix them. Yeah, we're saying the same. Well, you know, early in the conversation, talked about the way you're going to control is to be able to control the customers. Mm -hmm. So if you can, if you can do that and create value for the mm -hmm. people that are part of this company, hundred percent, it can make it, but yeah. that's, that, that's the, you know, that's the challenge, right? You mm -hmm. got to create that, 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 that deal. And you and I've had, you know, a lot of discussions about how to do it. And, everything. and so I, yeah. Can it be done? Sure. Yeah. Just again, I think it's going to take a group of people that uh, are committed to the plan. To, to be able to execute. Yeah. And that's, I think when you said 50%, I think you said 50% of people maybe know now what PDR is. I think that would, that would shock a lot of people. Um, I don't, I don't think it's personally that high just based off how many uh, repairs that we do every week. Um, how many people are brand new to PDR? I don't know what it is that found us through an online search or whatever. I would say it's maybe, maybe like 10 or 15% now that still know. That's why I feel like the, the future is so bright in PDR is because the, the amount of people that just drive right to a body shop or call their insurance company before going the PDR route is still way larger than people who, <clears throat> who call PDR, call for PDR yeah, first. But I've got the advantage of talking to a lot of people in a lot of different areas, you know, mm -hmm. I'm still been here pretty much my whole life and everybody yeah. knows who are. Right. And yeah. you know, I talk to a lot of people and a lot of people do know what paintless and repair is, but I get back that. It's not like that across the country. Everywhere, so, 100%. Whatever the, yeah, whatever the, I don't know what the actual number is, but you're right, there's a there's a crazy amount of people that don't know about it. Yeah, yeah. But when, and when they do experience it, they, they, as you know, they love it. Yeah, so I think the hardest part for me is the disconnect between those two things. So um, the fact that if I could talk to every person in the United States one-on-one, -on -one, there isn't a, a single person that would choose to go to a body shop over a PDR technician if we could fix it even if we could fix it to 90%, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, I don't know about that. You know, we, 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 we broke our pick on the insurance companies because we, we, we showed a model where we could save them tens of millions of dollars mm -hmm. if they would just uh, embrace paintless dent repair. But the industry so has been around so long and there's so many relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and we, and we, and we still have some really nice relationship with, with insurance companies, but, you think about how much money we could save them as an industry and they just will not use it. They yeah. won't do it. That's what I say. Like, um, that's what I'm saying. The customer, if I can talk to the customer and I could show them, Hey, here's what happens at the body shop, grind it down, paint it, replace panels, 1500 bucks. 
and then you take it over here and we get back there, push it. You never see we were there. We charge you 300 bucks. The customer would want that every time. In my opinion, it's faster, cheaper, better, no car fracture report, cleaner, mobile, a lot of times, et cetera. But the disconnect is that that's not what happens in actuality, whether it's insurance companies, that's a big part of it for sure. Or the fact that the body shops had a, you know, 50, 60 year head start over us or whatever. So when I look at the disconnect, that's why I feel like the future of PDR is so bright because there's still so much potential to, to bring the insurance or bring, not saying that it's easy or maybe not even possible. I don't know, but bring those people into our industry instead of the conventional repair industry. Yeah. Yeah. No, no argument here. It's, it's, yeah. it's there's the, well, Hey, look, there's a lot, there's the right way to do it. <laughs> there's a lot there there's without, without a doubt. Yeah, for sure. Well, I appreciate you coming on. Is there anything, um, you know, 30 years in this business, probably one, you know, one of the guys who've been around the longest, um, any tips or advice for all the guys that have probably 30 years left in this business? <laughs> well, uh, without sounding like, you know, an old guy that uh, doesn't have anything to offer. Uh, I'm going to probably just kind of circle back to what, what everybody probably understands already that, you know, if you keep your head down, and you you have the desire to do well in this business you can create a lot of wealth you can create a lot of people you can make a lot of people happy it's a legit business you know you're not you're not scamming anybody if you become really good at this business you can make a difference with people and it's it's i'm i'm blessed that i was able to come across this because at the time i didn't really give a shit what i did in my life i wanted to just work for myself but i'm real happy that you know, we landed in this, in this space and we're able to provide, you know, the kinds of uh, solutions for uh, the problems people have. And, and we continue to do, to, to do it this day. And I'm, I hope the people that uh, you're affiliated with, you know, keep their heads down and keep working at it because it's, it's a great business. Yeah. Yeah, no, it really is. And I think a lot of guys really have um, our hat or our, I can't think of the right word. I won't say happy. It's not a good enough word. Um, but are really um, blessed is a good way to say it, to be a part of this industry. I think a lot of people really feel that way. And I think if we go the right direction and do the right things and, and, and work together in as best a way as possible, we can actually change the industry to a lot of the ways like you and I have been talking about doing. Um, yeah, but I've met a, and you know, the great thing about it is I've met a lot of great guys in this business, man. Mm-hmm. You know, the guys want to be successful like yourself, good guys, man. Mm-hmm. You know, there's kind of people you want to be affiliated with. And you know, there's some idiots out there too, like every business. Mostly the guys that are doing well that have been around a while are good people. And and you know, you just want to be around people like that. So it's been it's been cool. I'm yeah. I'm I feel uh very, 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 very fortunate. Yeah, fortunate. That's the word I was looking for. Thank you for adding that. Um, yeah, thanks for starting Dempro. Like obviously it's played a huge part in my life, the success of my life through my dad, um, all that stuff. So I appreciate the influence that you've had on us. And then I named a few names, but there's many more names out there that came from the the Mitch and Dempro lineage. So you played your part and hopefully um we can try to take this industry to the next level as you look back in 20 years and be like, wow, look at that. <laughs> Love, Corey. I appreciate the time. Appreciate uh, you having me on for a few minutes to talk to me. Thank you. I appreciate it as well. We'll talk soon. Okay. Bye.